Good afternoon, everyone. How is everyone today? So good to see all of you. I wish I could see you a little better, but the lights are rather bright at the moment, so it's a little bit tough. But I'm so proud uh, to be here today and talk to you about what is America's number one killer of kids, gun violence, surpassing automobile fatalities for the first time in history in the last year. I'm Chris Brown. I'm the president of Brady. Brady is the oldest gun violence prevention organization in the United States. We're named, of course, for Jim and Sarah Brady, who worked tirelessly six years and seven votes it took to pass the Brady background check law. To date, that law has stopped more than four and a half million sales of guns to those unable to pass a simple background check. Thank you. We're incredibly proud of that law, and in fact, it's the firmament of our entire public health, public safety system around the sale of firearms in this country. But the numbers of those impacted by gun violence has been increasing dramatically through the years, and we're now faced with the reality that legislation alone is not an effective solution to what has become a public health crisis in our nation, and as I said, the leading cause of death in America's youth. When we look, to, when we look at other public health issues that have seen the most success across this country, we have to think to tobacco, cessation, and drunk driving. True, legislation played somewhat of a role, but it was really a collaborative effort on the part of so many sectors, including many of you represented here today, that drove the culture change which saw the greatest results. Our issue is no different. This is the type of collaborative effort we have to see across this country when we're dealing with firearm violence. I'm certain many of you saw the recent AP story about a shooter who opened fire in an Omaha, Nebraska target in January of this year. For the past three years, the shooter had been in and out of various mental health facilities and diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was also a gun owner, and his family would confiscate his weapons as he repeated, repeatedly tried to find ways to end his life. Eventually, he purchased a Glock, went into a target, and began firing. He was shot and killed by police arriving upon the scene. Thankfully, he did not hit anyone else, but if you look at the history of what we're seeing across the country, all too often, that is not the case. Here, I view this as a tragedy still, all the way around. The shooter's family tried everything they could to protect him, themselves, and in fact, also their community. There were so many opportunities to prevent what his family saw as an inevitability. Think about the myriad interactions he and his family had with the medical community and law enforcement. Because the shooter had never been held in a psychiatric facility for more than 72 hours, he never showed up as a prohibited purchaser in the database used in the Brady background check system. Additionally, Nebraska is not one of the 19 states with extreme risk protection laws, which allow the courts to remove weapons from homes where someone is at risk of harming themselves or others. This man needed help. He didn't get. Now he's gone, and his family will forever wonder what more they could have done. And a community was traumatized. Unquestionably, there is an urgent need for public health involvement here to intercede before other tragedies just like this. Now imagine a nation where we all worked together to ensure 
this couldn't happen. We all need to reframe our sense of advocacy and what that means. Does the Brady background check system need to be expanded? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely yes. And certainly at the federal level and in half of states which have not expanded the law to date. Half have, but half have not. Do we need every single state to enact extreme risk protection laws? Absolutely. We need to do that. And we need to ensure that first responders, family members, those who are uh, in law enforcement understand the availability of these critical tools to re remove guns from someone who's at risk to themselves or others. This case certainly demonstrates that need. And obviously, the stats also drive this home. Every day, we lose 65 people to gun suicide in our country. 65 people, higher than any peer nation. There are more gun suicide, there are more suicide deaths in America because of our higher rate of firearm suicide, which has a 90% on average lethality rate. We also know that the majority of those who attempt suicide and live and survive that do not go on to make another attempt but you seldom have that chance. Tragically, seldom have that chance when a firearm is involved. Imagine if integrating questions about gun ownership and safe storage were part of our standard of care in every type of practice. Mental and physical health professionals, uh, from pediatrics to geriatrics, and all the adjunct professions that also interact with patients, such as social workers and home care professionals. How can each of you, in your roles, bring about this change? How do you reframe your own sense of advocacy? What is your organization's sphere of influence in the community? How can our society support you with education campaigns that help reinforce the risks of unsecured guns in the home? Please ask yourselves those questions, knowing gun violence is, is a public health epidemic. America has, now has more guns than people. Some studies indicate that within the next five years, everyone, every single American will know someone impacted by gun violence. That is a uniquely American problem. It's an intersectional issue, leaving our unhoused population vulnerable, allowing those with suicidal ideation access to a particularly lethal means of suicide causing our school children PTSD from lockdown drills and mass shootings at school, and creating entire communities that are akin to a war zone. How do we bring about social norm change to turn this around? Well, first of all, research. We need to understand uh, how we move the curve downwards in the experience of gun violence. And finally, after two decades of the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, not being able to study one issue, one public health issue, among the panoply that they study, we were able to reverse that restriction on federal funding. Yay! But we need a lot more. We've lost a generation of researchers because of the Dickey Amendment, which was not a flat-out prohibition, but was interpreted, interpreted as such, and I understand why, by members of the CDC. Now we need to put a lot more private sector dollars and a lot more federal appropriated dollars into this research so that we can understand what works best. We know there's a whole range of things that we have to do. We want to know what we should invest in most. We also need to focus 
on public awareness and education through PSAs, public service announcements, on things like safe storage. I and Brady are incredibly proud of the End Family Fire campaign, which we have conducted in partnership with the Ad Council since 2018. Now we have over 110 ads that we have produced around this term, End Family Fire. That's our, that's our version of designated driver and secondhand smoke. It has over a billion views, and it's directed, unsurprisingly, at gun owners. This is apolitical. It's accepting that individuals seeing this content very likely have a gun in their home, and we want them to walk away with a single message, safely store that firearm. Why are we saying that? Because nine kids a day now are killed or injured with an unsecured gun in their own home. If you want to reduce suicide by firearm, safe storage is one of the number, ways, number one ways to do that other than getting rid of that firearm. And 75% of school shooters get their guns from a home. So to understand the power of this kind of message, I wanted to share with you next a little sizzle reel that gives you a very brief introduction to our N Family Fire campaign. Here it is. Hey, Dad. We have a gun. Why do you ask that, kiddo? Can I play with it? No, absolutely not. It's not a toy. You know that. Anyway, I need it to protect you, your sister and mom. But what about the eight kids who get shot every day by mistake? Where do you keep it? <laughs> it's hidden. I bet it's on the top shelf of the closet, under your sweatshirts. Is it loaded? You always told me to be curious. No. No, that's not what I meant. My name is Teresa Barber. My name is Charles Taway. I'm Tommy Anderson. My name is Siobhan DeBar. 90% of suicide attempts with a gun are fatal. Safe gun storage can prevent gun suicide. The majority of veteran suicides are from gun suicides. Female veterans die by suicide more often than female non-veterans. My service never stops. Our service never stops. All right. I'm in the house. Okay, uh, what do you see? I think I just heard something. I'm heading upstairs. Okay, I am almost there. I'm in the bedroom. Okay. Oh, shit. It's not here. What? The gun's not here. Wh what do you mean? Where is it? Cam. Cameron, are you in there? Open the door. Cam. Come on, Cam. We could be the healing. We, we could, could be, be the flower and the gun. Oh, I have seen that many, many times, these ads, and it's still, as a mom, as a human being, knowing far too many parents who've lost their children, far too many brothers who've lost siblings, it, it's hard to watch, but it's, it's on purpose, because this works. This campaign is working. We have a special focus of this campaign, thanks to partners in the state of Missouri. What we're finding is, uh, individuals who are exposed to this ad have a 350% increased likelihood to go out and research safe storage and begin the process of really making sure that guns in their home are secured. That's the power of this medium. That's the power of the heart married with the head. And for me, I always come back to this excerpt of a letter that I wanted to share with you all. We received this the first month after we started our flight of ads in 2018, focusing exclusively on unintentional injury of kids with guns in the home. But I should say now, thanks to our incredible leaders with N Family Fire who are here with Brady, Colleen, and Jen, we have expanded to include suicide and soon mass shootings, because all of these things can be prevented with safe storage. And I often think about this mother, this letter that I received from a mother in Indiana when I'm thinking about the impact of this campaign. I don't know this person. I've never met her. She took time to write to Brady. She'd seen the PSA in her home in Indiana. And it reminded her that she had a gun upstairs in her home that was unsecured. She was concerned because her son had been seeing a counselor at school, and she was concerned that he may have some suicidal ideation. She spoke with her husband about the importance of safe storage, 
and they, they purchased a gun safe. The next week, her son's counselor shared with her that their, her son had been having suicidal ideations and in fact had reported to her in a counseling session that he went to get that gun. Instead, he found the gun safe. In her letter to me, this mother said, I don't know if my son would have used the gun or not, but if he died, I would have lost him forever and died right along beside him. Thank you for this work. I think about that every day. Imagine if every story around suicidal thoughts had that type of ending. This is the life-saving power of messaging, a very simple solution available to every gun owner, and that is safe storage. There are other solutions, too, that I obviously you know about. Training is so important. Current practitioners and our medical students need to be trained in how to ask about guns in the home and safe storage. And obviously, the absolute necessity of extreme risk protection laws. Again, if we're imagining a safer world, think of the difference these laws could make in decreasing gun suicides, school and community shootings, and instances of domestic violence. And it won't be enough to have these laws on the books. We have to ensure that those in our communities know they exist and how they can take advantage of them. As we say at Brady, we must work across Congress, courts, and communities to end the epidemic of gun violence. Again, please think about your spheres of influence here. We need to change culture. It's not, this is not a political issue in the end. We've done so much work around end family fire Folks who own guns, who have rich histories of gun ownerships in their households, are desperate for the right kinds of solutions. And we know policy obviously plays a role. So does enforcement. So does cultural norm change. And public health professionals are on the cutting edge of that. We know at Brady, only through a truly collaborative, collaborative efforts amongst all sectors do we have a chance to change the tide. We have to. Our lives, lives are at stake. I also want, to know, want everyone to know we have uh, a lot of great people here. Matt Heron, who's on our team, um, is here. We, you can find us from 7 a.m., I think. I'm not sure where Matt is, but 7 a.m. is what he told me, until 5 p.m. in the Coral Foyer. We have a lot of more materials, a lot of Brady swag. Please go to our website. BradyUnited.org, you can find out how you can be engaged within your sphere of influence. There's so much that we can do. I'm going to ask three things of you. Partner with Brady on C3 non-political programs to change culture norms around guns. We are desperate for that, and with the right kinds of partnerships, we can save lives, and we will. Two, spread awareness about End Family Fire. Go to endfamilyfire.org. You can find out about it through our website. Please help us do this. This is a social messaging campaign as much as it is a grassroots campaign. Finally, think and talk about gun violence as a public health epidemic. It is. It is. And by treating it that way, I think we can save lives. Thank you all for what you do, and thank you all for the time today. <laughs>